ain't my bride. Let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. Now try to imagine this scene. You are driving your new car down Parliament Street in Westminster, England. It is October the 20th in the year 1896. And you're driving a steel stallion that you just got from France. You're in town so you can't go fast. I mean, the car is barely idling in first gear when suddenly a whistle blows and a policeman walks up sternly to you and says, Where is your footman? And why are you operating this contraption at more than two miles an hour? And so a Mr. Walter S. Bursey became the last known Englishman to receive a traffic citation for violating the dreaded Red Flag Act of 1865. And who knows how much longer that law would continue to cripple the development of English cars had it not been for the work of a man that in some way single-handedly created the British automobile industry. Of course I'm talking about Harry John Lawson. Now before we get to Mr. Lawson, let me explain this Red Flag Act thing. Remember that the steam engine was born and raised in England, and Richard Trevithick invented both the steam car and steam locomotive at about the same time. For the next 60 or so years, companies that used one or the other vied for dominance on English soil, and the British government m made certain that they capitalized on it. For the railroad companies, the Crown would sell land rights to them so they could make their railroads. However, it would be the most useless land, most difficult to make a railroad on, and have to pay absurd money for said rights, in some cases over a hundred times its value. For the motor coach lines, they would use existing roads, but pay a ridiculous toll for the privilege each time they rolled onto a highway. By the early 1860s, the railroads had won the war. They had the capital to pay the price demanded and so over time owned their own British rail network. But for the motor coaches, the tolls never ended and so they could not compete with the horse-drawn coaches for fares. But that didn't stop Queen Victoria from putting the final nail in the British car's coffin. She felt that motor coaches were dirty and smelly and really didn't want them to be used on her roads at all. So in 1865, she signed the Red Flag Act, which required motor coaches to have a footman ringing a bell and a second man waving a red flag walking in front of the thing. The speed limit was two miles an hour on the roads of Britain if you were in a motor coach. So motor coaches died in England. Brits needed to go a long distance, took a train. For local care needs, a carriage or horse will do just fine. This is the motoring England that Harry Lawson grew up in. Born in London in 1852, he was from a young age a keen opportunist. A few years after Her Majesty signed the Red Flag Act into law, her son, Edward, Prince of Wales, looked for a loophole and found it in a new industry, the bicycle. Bicycles were even cleaner than horses and didn't have the smell. Woohoo! Young Harry saw this as an opportunity, and in 1873 began to make bikes to the delight of the early Victorian cyclists. Harry realized that if he could make a better bike, he would get the attention of said prince and make even more money. So he did. And in 1876, designed, built, and offered for sale the first modern safety bike in history. Now, like Benz, he did have a competitor, and the next year, another fellow by the name of John Starley built a safety bike that was more like a true modern bicycle and took much of his business. But Harry had accomplished his goal. He was now an innovator in a new industry that Prince Bertie supported, and the Prince knew his name. 
By the mid-1880s, Lawson was a man of means and of some influence due to his loyal connections. Royal connections? <laughs> and he was also another person who went to the Paris Expedition of 1889 and saw the motor vehicles, gas and steam, on display, and was horrified. In France, where the government didn't make cars all but illegal, the industry was already flourishing. And back home in Merry England, the best you could hope for was a bike and a day of minimal rain. He knew something had to change, but he had every intention of making every last buck out of it as possible. After all, he reasoned, if the British government can do it, why can't I? And so, as discreetly as he could, he began to buy the rights to every patent and license he could that pertained to automobiles in England. True, cars were not illegal in England, but the law made them impossible to operate, so Lawson was able to buy all of these rights at bargain prices. By the beginning of 1896, he had managed to purchase not only the patent rights to all sorts of automotive components and accessories, but license to the engines and cars in England for Daimler, Boli, Didion Bouton, and others as well. Harry was determined to own a piece of every car made in Britain and also to make sure people could drive them. So he began to lobby Parliament about the issue while at the same time reached out to his old cycling friend, Prince Andrew, and called in a favor. The good prince talked some sense into his mom and in November of 1896, the Red Flag Act was rescinded. Lawson and everyone in England that cared about cars gave a huge hurrah! Harry himself organized an event to celebrate, the first London to Brighton run on November 14th, 1896. Finally, the British car industry could flourish! This is exactly what Harry hoped for. Yes, you could now make cars in England, and people would now have a reason to buy them. And he had spent nearly a decade making the largest monopoly of the automotive industry in the country, the British Motor Syndicate. Even if you tried to make cars outside of it, most of the important parts of a car he held the patents on. So either way, you go away or pay up. The perfect evil plan to conquer the world. Now, Harry did use every media outlet at his disposal to promote motoring, the motor car, and, of course, his various brands of British-made cars. He was the most respected man of motoring to the public in England back in 1896. Within the industry, however, his name was not so rosy. Lawson was loathed for his attempt to monopolize the British car industry, and many manufacturers challenged his patents in court and won, and in other cases, simply ignored them outright. Also, his association with an American con artist named Edward Pennington, who I'll talk about in another episode, didn't help matters either. By 1897, Harry was in trouble. He sold off his interest and resigned from Daimler, England, to try to put out fires elsewhere. His holdings whittled away, and his patent rights became worthless within a few years. His old buddy, the prince, turned his back on him when it came to the public light, just how unethical his business practices were. His career finally led him to prison, serving time for fraud. Personally, I don't consider Harry Lawson to be a tragic figure in the automotive history. Unlike John DeLorean, who was found innocent on all charges, Lawson was, as a businessman, a selfish bully who got exactly what he deserved. Despite this, his work is still important in making Great Britain one of the great nations in the history of the motor car. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History. I'll see you next week. Peace.